I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and here today with me is Mark Yaxley, Managing Director at SWP. Thank you so much for joining me online today. Great to see you again. Great to see you as well, Charlotte. Yeah, so we have a lot to go through today. There's a lot going on in the gold market. I know we just talked really a couple of months ago, but a lot has happened. I think investors, as we were talking about before we started this interview, are really looking for some answers. So we'll see what we can do for them today. I know that when we were speaking at VRIC all the way back in May, you said you thought we were in the early stages of a stock market collapse. And you mentioned that typically for gold, when that's happening, it will also decline. So we've seen gold decline this month quite precipitously. And I wondered if for you, are we just in that declining phase at the moment? That's a really good question. Uh, generally speaking, yes, when the stock market declines, you'll see precious metals follow suit. And then the second step is kind of take off and, and realize some pretty big gains. Obviously, we haven't seen that. And I know that that's been disappointing for a lot of precious metal investors that are expecting more from gold right now because they feel that the market conditions are kind of ideal for gold to be doing really well. But when I look at the numbers, I, I want to remind precious metal investors that gold, even though it's it's not always in the green, is actually doing a lot better than some of its peers. So I pulled some numbers this morning. Year to date, gold's down 5%, which you know could be slightly disappointing, like we said. But the S&P is down 20%. The Dow is down 14%. NASDAQ, 29%. Bitcoin is down 52%. And even the Bloomberg bond index is down 10%. So Compared to its peers, gold is actually offering quite a bit of protection. And if you thought you could avoid all of that and step away from the markets and just keep your cash in savings while well, inflation is running uh, officially at 9.1% in the United States, but unofficially, it's probably in the range of about 12 to 15%. So even by holding your money in the bank, you're losing somewhere between 9 and 15% of the value of your dollars. So I think the message for investors right now is um, you can't always win, i.e. you cannot, cannot always make money on a trade. However, you can cut your losses. And I think that's the role that gold is playing for investors who are in precious metals right now is they are reducing their losses during these very, very challenging times. So we've been talking a little bit about the U.S. dollar and U.S. dollar strength is something that I keep seeing come up when people talk about factors that are hurting gold. So with that in mind, I'm wondering if you could talk about what you see coming for the dollar moving forward. Well, that's absolutely right, Charlotte. The, U the strong U.S. dollar is the number one factor uh, that is putting pressure on the gold price right now. There's a lot of support and, and fundamental reasons to own gold, but the U a strong U.S. dollar and not only a strong U.S. dollar, we're talking record high strength for the U.S. dollar. It's currently at the U.S. dollar index is sitting at 106 as of this morning. Uh, it's coming off a 20 year high of 109 on July 14th. And it's, it's up 10 percent year to date, which is really significant. And so if there's one stat that really jumped out at me when I was preparing for this interview is in the second quarter, the U.S. index was up 6.5 percent. And in the second quarter, gold was down 6.4 percent. So you see that the correlation is really one-to-one -one between the two. And that's obviously putting a lot of pressure on the gold price. If you contrast that to other major currencies, like the Japanese yen, for example, the yen is down 18% year-to-date versus US dollar, and yet gold is up 19% priced in yen year-to-date. And that same trend is true of the Turkish lira, the British pound, the euro. So... Basically, this flee to U.S. dollars and the strengthening of the U.S. dollar is, is having that direct impact. There's, there, there's, you don't have to look any further, really, as to, for reasons why gold hasn't done well. So the bet is, as an investor, is if you believe that the U.S. dollar, the strength of the U.S. dollar will remain or if it is slowly going to taper off. We've seen a little bit of weakening over the past few trading sessions, but I think all indications right now are that the USD will remain relatively strong, which is gonna to continue to put pressure on gold. So you can't have really high expectations for a gold breakout under these conditions. Right, and so that really explains, I think, quite well what's going on with the dollar. We do still, of course, have inflation running rampant in the US and elsewhere in the world. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how inflation relates to a strong US dollar, how those interplay with each other. 
Yeah, it's interesting because inflation is really um, the result of a strong U.S. economy. Uh, it is the, the kind of the driving force of the labor market is so good in the U.S. right now that people have an abundance of savings and are driving up prices and driving down margins for producers. So it's, a, it's kind of an interesting conundrum for the Fed to find itself in. I think ultimately, you know, expectations going forward is the Fed has absolutely no choice but to continue to raise their rates aggressively. I fully expect that they're going to raise rates by 75 basis points at the next meeting. And there's even now chatter on the street that we might see uh, kind of the elusive 1% raise. There, there's some pricing in the market right now that indicates that uh, there's some belief on Wall Street that, 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 that the raise might be as aggressive as 1%. The European Central Bank is poisoned for a half percent raise, uh, which is significant for them because they keep their interest rates ultra low or even negative uh, for, for extended periods of time. And then you have the Canadian Central Bank as well, which is looking at uh, probably a 50 to 75% basis point raise. So the trend is, is kind of entrenched and set to continue. They don't have control of inflation at this point. It was looking month to month like they might have kind of, it had reached its top and then it, it increased from, I believe, 8.6% to 9.1% in the US from uh, May to June. So uh, all indications are that interest rates will continue, um, likely to support uh, a strong USD as well going forward. Right. And you mentioned the upcoming Fed meeting, which is scheduled for next week. As you mentioned, I think a lot of people are really focusing on what size of hike will we get. And that's, of course, important. You've kind of gone over your thoughts on that, but I wonder if there are any other takeaways that you'll be looking for from that meeting. Um, not necessarily. I mean, I, I think at this point, uh, you know, if you pay attention uh, to, to the market news uh, and, and, and you're relatively relatively in tune with what's happening uh, this is fairly routine at this point um, because the fed is reactive to the situation they're not in control of the situation if they were in control we might you know pay close attention to that meeting and really want to see in what direction they're trying to point us or move forward in this controlled kind of well-planned well-staged uh, approach but I, I really don't think that's the case um, they've they've been partially responsible for the situation that we find ourselves in now and, and really, they're just reactive at this point. They're desperately trying to get a grip without sending us directly into, uh, into a strong recession. You know, we're already entrenched in a recession. Anyone who, who thinks otherwise just has to look at some of the numbers that we talked about earlier. Uh, and eventually, the, the, jobs, the jobs data will follow as well, and we'll start to correct. But um, I'm not really that worried about what they're going to be talking about. You know, I might gl glance at the minutes, but full expectation is you're going to see the rate hikes that, that are expected. Right. And, you know, what you're describing, I think, is so true. We do go through the motions of looking forward to these meetings, looking at what they say. But really, for the last months and months, it seems like it's been basically what people expected. So, of course, we'll be watching, but we may not get surprises there. I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about inflation, because when you mentioned the surprise that we got where it came in higher than expected, it's been happening a lot lately. Do you think that it's topped out at this point or is there still more that could come? Uh, I don't believe we've topped out at this point, no. Uh, I think we have a, a ways to go. The real inflation numbers, or I guess you could call them kind of like alternative data points that, uh, that we're seeing have inflation pegged between 12 to 15 percent. Um, so likely that the CPI number will continue to trend towards real inflation as 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 much as uh, you know the authorities uh, would like it not to. I believe you're going to continue to see that trend, um, just basing it on real life you know experiences. Uh, living close to Alberta, living close to a major oil producing province and and seeing what we're paying for gas here in British Columbia, what we're paying for our groceries, uh, cost of living is is it's not under control and and uh, there seems to be more pain to come uh, in terms of inflation at this point. Yeah. Right. And let's check in about recession as well, because that's a topic that we touched on when we spoke previously a couple of months ago as well. You said definitely it looked like that's where we were heading. Now you're saying it sounds like, you know, we're, we're definitely in one at this point. Interestingly, though, if you look at the headlines, people are still flip flopping on, are we going there? Are we not going there? So what is it that makes you so certain? Um, 
Well, I mean, in terms of uh, certainly in terms of uh, where the markets are heading, I think you're going to see uh, the proof is in the pudding. You don't have to look much further than than uh, some of these declines that have already occurred since the beginning of the year to uh, to determine that we're we're in we're in rough financial shape. And it's my full expectation that we're not nearly done. Uh, I would assume we're probably about halfway there. Worst case scenario. So, you know. If, if you don't want to call it a recession yet, um, you know, and, and you're one of those optimistic types that feels like this is just a blip on the map, I, you know, I, I disagree with you. I think uh, all indications right now are that uh, things are going to be worse. Um, the Fed is going to continue raising interest rates, which are going to have a direct impact on the markets. Um, the war in Europe, which is extremely expensive, not only distracting, but extremely expensive from a, from a, from a cost perspective for all those involved. Uh, that means more debt. Uh, that means more of the same. I mean, the, the, the driver behind the situation that we find ourselves right in now is too much credit and too much debt in the system. Uh, a lot of the inflation um, and the, the overvaluation or, or valuation of of, of uh, the stock market is driven by debt and credit, and, and we're not finding the solutions necessarily, and the, the authorities are not taking the steps necessarily to reduce that. It's, it's one of their uh, historical failures. They most likely will continue to do that, and so I can only see the situation getting a, little, well, a lot worse probably before it gets better, and that's why it is important for people to con consider investments that may not uh, have a huge return immediately, but we'll protect them from that downside. And, and, and that's where gold and, and silver fit in in the portfolio. Right, and of course, as a precious metals dealer, you're speaking on a day-to-day -day basis with people who want to both buy and sell precious metals like gold. I wondered if you could speak a little bit about any of the trends that you've been seeing lately. Absolutely. Uh, first trend that, that's got everybody uh, a little bit surprised in the industry is it's busier than we expected. I mean, the price is moving downwards. Uh, so, you know, if, if at a top level, you look at that and you say, well, demand must kind of be softening for precious metals. Uh, that's not the case. The demand for physical metal is actually about 60% higher than we had, SWP had budgeted for, for, for this time of the year. It is the summer. Some people step away from their portfolios a little bit, but demand is definitely there. And the proof is um, in the premiums for the products. So premiums, I always say, are one thing that don't lie. Uh, that's because producers and suppliers will only charge higher premiums when there's a lot of demand for their products. They don't want to sit on inventory. They want to move them out the door as quickly as possible and recover their investment. So uh, they will only price things higher in terms of premium when the demand is there. And premiums just went up again this week. We noticed uh, across the board, basically, at a wholesale level, which is an indication that the demand is very strong. And the other trend that we've noticed, and this one I've seen before in my career, is during periods like this, when there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of change eminence in the air, is that sophisticated large investors start buying gold. And we've been noticing that. We started seeing it in June, and it's continuing into July. These are people that are moving you know, significant, amount, significant amount of money um, in, into physical precious metals, trying to protect themselves in their portfolios. They, they're not your typical gold bugs. These aren't people necessarily that are loyal and buying gold on a monthly basis. These are one-time large allocations. We've noticed that trend as well. Wow. And that's very interesting because you mentioned that they are not the usual buyers of gold. And typically we hear that we need those generalist type of investors to come in before you get a significant market move. So that seems like it does that bode well, I would think. That's absolutely right, Charlotte. There's, there's a number of, of players in the market or different segments, and it, it's encouraging when you see a segment that usually isn't loyal to gold stepping in. I'll also mention that uh, central banks are still adding uh, to their net positions, net overall positions are still uh, moving uh, into the green through April and May. I don't have the June numbers yet, but that's another large segment, uh, obviously, or another consideration when it comes to physical precious metals. Right. And so if you're an investor looking at this situation, is this a good time to buy gold when you've got the lower price, but you do have that higher premium? How would you approach that? Two part answer. First part is simple. If you don't already own gold and or silver or platinum and palladium in your portfolio, you absolutely have to. There's not a single good reason that anyone can give at this point in time as to why they, they, they've chosen to have zero allocation of precious metals. You look at the, his, the history 
2008, 2011, more recently, kind of the COVID uh, era where, where gold and silver were must-haves in your portfolios. We're, we're right on the cusp, if not already in a situation where you need to have precious metals. Second part answer is if you already have precious metals, should you be adding more? Should you take advantage of this dip uh, to add to your portfolio? And that's a really good question. Um, and it's one that a lot of loyal precious metal investors are struggling with because they don't want to fall or, or buy it, you know, uh, while the knife is still falling. But, you know, if you look at it objectively, we've come off the recent high, which was about $2,030 in August of 2020. We're about 15% below that right now. So you don't want to be buying at the all-time high. That's always a risky entry point for any investment. We've come off that about 15 points. So there's there's definitely that argument to be made that, you know, it's a, it's a relatively safe range to be buying in. The downside is probably fairly limited. You talk about the floor. And we were we were looking uh, this morning during our sales call, actually, at the uh, which you would be familiar with the all in sustaining cost for gold miners uh, to produce an ounce of gold. So that's really all of their costs. Um, what is the sorry, what is the the all in cost to produce one ounce of gold? So the average was up from uh, Q4 of last year into Q1 by nine percent. So it's costing miners more and more money to to produce. But more interestingly, is if you look at that entire range of uh, gold miners and what it costs them to produce. You have some that do it very cheaply and you have some that do it are much more on the expensive end. The, the 90th percentile is really what we look at. And right now that 90th percentile of producers, it's costing them just about or slightly more than where the spot price is right now. And so what ends up happening is that's usually where the floor gets set for the price of gold. Um, and if the price, the spot price continues to decline or the cost to produce continues to increase, then those producers, it's not sustainable. They'll no longer produce. They're going to close the mines, which will affect the supply side of the equation. So that's, uh, it's, it's an interesting indicator to look at and it's significant right now because it, it's starting to happen that, uh, you know, that 90th percentile is, is, is either near the red or, or break even point, uh, when producing. Okay, that's really interesting. I think that about wraps up all the questions that I had to ask you for today. But before we let go, I wondered if you had any final thoughts that you wanted to share with the audience. Yeah, and I wanted to mention this, Charlotte. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, I wrote this in our, our quarterly newsletter, which goes out to our followers. So I, I, you know, I feel comfortable saying it to your followers as well. Is Remain patient. And if there's one thing that I've learned about gold and silver over the last 16 years is that they always do their job, but they don't always do it as quickly as you want them to. You know, people, we live in this day and age where we expect immediate results and gold and silver don't work that way. They're kind of slow moving animals, but they always come through in the end. They always provide the kind of uh, security and stability that, that they, they're, they're designed to. And so be patient and let them do their work. Uh, I think you'll be happy with your decision at the end of the day. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming on to talk about what's going on in the gold market. I know that it's a little bit hard to be patient, but I really appreciate the numbers you shared earlier. I think they show gold value and hopefully will provide some hope for people who are waiting for that price move up. Thanks again. I hope so as well. Yeah, thank you, Charlotte. Of course. And once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and this is Mark Yaxley with SWP.